It's been three years since you wrote the, that famous book. That famous book, yes. Uh, austerity is the history of a dangerous idea. Uh, in this time, austerity is no more an idea. It's pretty much uh, the major poles that have been affected throughout Europe. Uh, and the question that, uh, <laughs> that arises from this is, is it reversible now? So, all right, so let's think about it this way. Was austerity the policy or was austerity a side effect? So what have we found out recently from the paper that was done by the German Business School that according to their estimates, a full 95% of the cash that went to Greece round trip through Greece and went straight back to creditors, which in plain English is banks, right? So public taxpayers' money was pushed through Greece to uh, basically bail out banks. And part of that was an adjustment that had to happen on the Greek balance sheet. So austerity becomes a side effect of a general policy of bank bailouts that nobody wants to own. Right? So that's really what happened. Okay? Now, put that to one side. That's done. That's over. So the question is, where do we go next? Now, the overall fiscal stance for Europe is slightly positive. That is to say, we're not mindlessly squeezing anymore. But aggregate demand is, thank you very much, aggregate demand is too low and uh, everybody recognizes that. F monetary policy is trying to do too much, or at least what it's doing is having less effect than we would like for the amount of money that's being spent. And then everything's put on this thing called structural reform, which seems to imply, in the minds of some, that all you need to do is do some version of the German Hartz reforms and everything will be okay. Now, that policy mix is going nowhere. I think we're beginning to recognize that that's the case. So we're in an interesting moment, we're in a new space, but we're sort of stumbling towards where we go next after this big contractionary episode. If posterity had no scientific uh, justification, how did it come up to be the, the prevailing, uh, you know, again, policy? I mean, even if it wasn't central, it actually yeah. was there. So. Well, in the following sense, um, the Schwabian housewife pops up, right? So that's common sense for you. So I mean, if you think about it, if we're making a scientific claim, so Merkel's main sort of macroeconomic visor is a random Schwabian housewife. And they know how to make ends meet. Okay, well, you know, there's the whole confusion between households and budgets and government budgets and households don't get to print their own money. Households don't get to tax people across generations, etc. The households don't get to make intergenerational promises. So you have to kind of take the next step and explain all that to say why the common sense version doesn't work. So then you get to the next level, which is the scientific version, which basically says that people actually think that the world's going to be a better place if you manage to cut the budget in the middle of a recession, because that means that they will pay less in taxes 10 years from now, realizing that they'll immediately be so boosted by confidence, they'll run out to IKEA, buy a couch, and end the recession, right? So the minute you start to go through all this, you recognize this is patent nonsense. Now, why is it that we're peddling nonsense? Well, let's go back to the first answer I gave you. Nobody wants to own up to a gigantic bailout of the entire European banking system that took six years. Austerity was a cover. For some, it's a true belief. I believe that for Dr. Schauble, he really, really believes this stuff. I really believe that Jens Weidmann believes this stuff. Um, there's, in my opinion, no scientific basis for it in the context of the Eurozone, right? Uh, but uh, it was a set of policy choices that fitted the moment. The key thing is, now we're beyond that, where do we go next? Yeah, this is what you said, you described your book as uh, that uh, Europe created something that was too big to bail. Yeah, exactly. The banking system. And it's always on the brink of destruction, I mean... Uh, well, think about it to this day, right? So we have about, by the best estimates, about 1.3 trillion euros in non-performing loans. Now, the Greek banking system itself is capitalized at about 16%, which is amazing. It's like they've got the biggest capital buffers in Europe. You've got really safe banks, but they're not lending. They're not lending to anyone. So why are they not lending to anyone? Because the economy sucks, right? So you have this complete disconnect between a monetary policy at the European level, which is pushing interest rates to negative rates. Then you've got banks that are being encouraged to recapitalize almost to like ridiculous proportions. But they've got so many non-performing loans on their book that they don't actually want to lend to anybody. They just want to deal with that, particularly because the regulators are telling them this. And then you have all these small businesses in Greece and elsewhere, which can't get a loan to save their lives. So this is just a horrible policy mix. Yeah, but can it be fixed? I mean, you've uh, criticized time and again uh, the European Central Bank and how it, how it works. Uh, can it work or is the euro fundamentally flawed? Uh, the euro is fundamentally flawed. Whether the European Central Bank is fundamentally flawed is a different issue. I mean, I would give Draghi both the Nobel Prize in Economics and the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, 
for what he's managed to do since 2012. Because under Trichet, what we effectively had in Europe was a currency board with an inflation target that was determined to fight an inflation that didn't exist. And it raised rates twice in the middle of a recession in 2011 and forced massive contractions upon economies that led to huge GDP losses, which we still haven't gotten back. So who runs this thing is incredibly important. And Draghi, through policies which started off with the LTROs and went up to quantitative easing, has gradually transformed it into a real central bank. And he deserves applause for that. But the problem is, as he says all the time, he wishes that fiscal policy would play a more supportive role. He started saying this at his Jackson Hole speech in 2014, and he says it pretty much every month. No one's listening. Because the countries that have the fiscal space in Europe, the Germans and others, don't want to do it because they're living off exports and everything's doing fine. And everybody that doesn't have the fiscal space can't do it because they're not allowed to, because of the compacts that they've signed. So again, we find ourselves in a policy mix that's been dictated by having this shared currency, but at the same time not having common fiscal institutions or other things that would balance out the system. But again, I mean, is Draghi uh, someone that you would uh, actually say that he's done such a good job? I mean, come to think of it, here, last summer, he actually is the one who's supposed to be... I mean, could the last summer's crisis be fixed with uh, flows from the ECB? Well, in, in fairness to Draghi, apparently he didn't want to actually do the starving of the Greek banking system, but it was his governing council that forced his hand. So there's a question again is, you know, how much, think about this. So the ECB is meant to be politically independent, right? Okay, well, it's the governing council is telling him he's the one who has the rational liquidity. And that was using the ECB as a political instrument to punish the Greek government. That's what that was. Let's not have any illusions about it. So it's a very, very powerful institution. And he's trying to do the best as he can just with monetary policy. But to go back to the example of the Greek banks, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You can make a bank solvent, but you can't make it lend if the underlying economy is knackered. And when you've been basically kicking the economy, as they've done to Greece for the past six years, that it's lost between, depending on how you count it, 23 and 30% of GDP, people are delevering. They're not trying to take on credit. And those that are taking, trying to take on credit can't find any. Hmm. Uh, yeah, and what about the EU? I mean, we have the, the Brexit referendum ahead of us. And uh, have you picked a side on this? <laughs> Well, here, here's the thing. My, my side is I'm very pro-European, but I'm against the euro. So if I still lived in the United Kingdom, I would have an interesting choice. So if you look at Larry Elliott in The Guardian, Larry has, uh, has said that uh, he thinks he should vote for exit because this might be the existential crisis that blows up the euro. Now, why would you want to blow up the euro? Because that will be terrible, etc., etc. Because the long-run effect of the euro is going to be to drive Western European wages down to Eastern European levels in global competition for export share with the Chinese. That's one interpretation as to where this all goes. And that's going to be fine for the Eastern Europeans coming up. It's going to be great for very efficient exporters in the north. It's going to be absolutely disaster for France and parts of Italy, if not all of Italy, and certainly for Greece. Now, if you have a system in which one side's running a surplus and the other side isn't allowed to run a deficit because of the rules, the only thing the other side can do is permanently contract their economies to allow someone else to make money selling BMWs. I don't see that ending well. So perhaps it's better to nip it in the bud when you've got the chance. Now, the thing is with Brexit, I don't think that's what the debate's all about. This is Trumpism. Everybody's got a version of it. Trumpism? Trumpism. Remember Donald Trump? Yeah, right, OK. So well, here's what I mean by Trumpism. For the past 25 years, particularly the center left, has told the bottom 60% of the, of the income distribution in the country is the following story. Globalization is good for you. It's awesome. It's really great. And we're going to sign these trade agreements. Don't worry, there'll be compensation. It'll be fine. You'll all end up as computer programmers. It'll be fantastic, right? And by the way, we don't really care because we're all going to move to the middle because that's where the voters are. And they're the people with money. And they're the ones that we really care about. So you get the shift under Schroeder. You get the same thing under Blair to New Labour, whatever. And you make that move. And you basically take the bottom 30% of the income distribution and say, we don't care what happens to you. You're now something to be policed. You're now something to have uh, your behaviors change. We're going to nudge you into better patterns, as the Americans like to say. It's a very paternal, it's very patronizing relationship. This is no longer the warm embrace of social democracy, arm in arm with so solidarity with the working classes. They're there to be policed and excluded in their housing estates so that you feel safe in your neighborhoods, so that you can have your private schools, there they have their public schools, which you don't really want to pay taxes for anymore. So once this has evolved over 20 years, you have this revolt not just against Brexit, it's not about the EU, it's about the elites, it's about the 1%. It's about the fact that your parties that were meant to serve your interests have sold you down the river.
Uh, yeah, maybe they're all the same. The the, think how ridiculous this is. Think of the Scottish independence thing, right? So these guys vote to stay in because the entire British establishment links arm in arm and says, don't do it. And you've got to wonder why, because ultimately, who's going to get hurt if they do it? People with money. So they're saying, don't do this, right? So, okay, they go, all right, then we won't do it, right? So then this, the SNP, the anti-austerity party, are in there like, I ah, well, we didn't win that, but you know, we're still in power, great, on you go. Okay, so what happens next? Well, if apparently, if there's going to be a Brexit vote and to get out, then the Scots are going to vote to get back in. Okay, this is fun, right? So you're going to give up George Osborne, who's an austerity chancellor, for who? Dr. Schauble. So your nice little Scottish welfare state is going to be really well protected by the tender embrace of the Germans. How's that working out for the Greeks? Not really. Not right. Really. People aren't thinking this one through. This is basically a revolt against technocracy. It is a revolt against governance by unrepresented, unelected, undemocratic elites. And having had a government where every single district in your country says no chance, 61% say no chance, and then the result is we're going to do it anyway. You're basically proving to people that democracy is irrelevant. So this is global Trumpism. And at the end, it's a no-win scenario. I mean, well, it's a no-win scenario until basically elites figure out that at the end of the day, as I like to say to my American hedge fund friends, the Hamptons is not a defensible position. The Hamptons are a very rich area on Long Island that lie on low-lying beaches. Very hard to defend a low-lying beach. Eventually, people will come for you. Uh, okay, uh, you finished your book actually, I won't get back to that. Uh, you finished your book actually suggesting that the European countries should actually follow the, the example of Iceland. Okay, but uh, isn't there a, you know, a danger of you yourself going into a fallacy of composition as we call it, you know, seeing that something works for Iceland, could it actually work for uh, the EU? No, oh, no, that's true. I mean, my point with Iceland was just a comparison of the relative positions of Greece and Iceland. Both of them are very small economies. Now, you know, let's think about this by moving away from uh, Iceland per se for a minute. It's true the Icelandic default was on other people. They didn't default on themselves. There's a question of which one's actually worse, right? If you write a bond on him, and he sells it to him, and you default, right? Who's lost any money here? I mean, you're all just borrowing from each other, right? It's kind of ridiculous. So, you know, there's that one. So let's, let's move uh, back to Greece on this one. How much would it have cost in 2010 when the whole crisis was started by saying, it turns out that the other guys lied about the budget deficit, right? Remember this one? How much, when you got the spike, how much would it have cost to take every bond on the open market that was subject to what they call rollover risk and just bury it? would it cost 50 billion euros. How much are we spending a month now on quantitative easing? Uh, much more. 90 billion euros. Maybe it's 80, whatever. It's more, right? So every month, we're basically burying the problem. If we'd just done it then, it would have cost nothing. So how much have we wasted? How many lives have been destroyed? How many families have been broken up? How many people have died unnecessarily because of crappy healthcare, because the budget's been crushed? So what was this for? If the EU at the end of the day in the Euro is not actually improving the lives of the majority of people, what is it for? That's the question they've got no answer to. Yeah, but I mean, who could have done that? I, yeah, then Pasok was in government here, and uh, so it's a part of uh, the European Social Democratic Party. Um, and they did. And actually, they, what they got from their, their European uh, counterparts was that you, okay, you follow this, you bring the IMF and you, you do the traditional recipe. <laughs> Yeah, but the thing was that was all secondary to the fact that what this exposed was that you had banks like Deutsche Bank, which at that time was 86% of German GDP, running on a 2% capital cushion. So if it has to take losses on Greek assets and other people freak out about Portuguese assets and then they dump them and then they dump the Irish assets and suddenly they all shit themselves and they dump Spain and Spain's too big to sail all at once, you crash the capital cushions of every systemically important bank in Europe. So Greece was important only because Greece was the trigger, the accelerator for what was the threat. And the threat was a bank run through the bond markets of Europe and a crashing of the, all of the big banks of Europe. So you guys got put in a triage, not for your own good, but for everybody else's errors in terms of their allowing their financial systems to grow out of control. And then, okay, I keep, uh, I have in the back of my mind the reason for your visit here. You know, the, the event today at the Friedrich, mm -hmm. Friedrich Ebert Stiftung with uh, our finance minister, uh, who comes from this radical left government, who is actually, according to recent uh, 
not rumors, actually circulation, there's a, a flirt with the social democracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, could this move the social democracy to the left so that it will propose something? Well, else? I mean, you know, from an outsider's perspective, I mean, if you, Syriza's program was about as radical left as the Swedish Social Democrats in 1982. So it's a question of perspective here. It's not as if they were basically like Trotskyites that were threatening class warfare. So, you know, and, in you know, and ultimately what have they done? They've signed a memorandum. So, you know, radical, well, I'm not even sure what that means at this point in time. What's clear is that every single social democratic party in Europe needs to find a new reason to exist. Because, as I said earlier, over the past 20 years, they have sold their core constituency down the line for a bunch of floaters in the middle who don't particularly care for them. Because if the only offers on the agenda are basically austerity and tax cuts for those who already have, versus austerity tax cuts, apologies, and a minimum wage. Why am I going to go for that? Right? Why go for the shitty version? So a, couple, a little while ago, I was at the SPD headquarters and I gave a big speech, and I referred to, to the SPD as the second-hand enforcers of a creditor's paradise. And that's sadly what they've become, and it's what they've all become. So if they don't actually find some new way of connecting with the real lives, real interests, and real hopes and desires, of the people who used to be their concern, their core constituency, which are the working classes of Europe, they will die. And if you consider the SPD got 19% in Baden-Württemberg in the last election, they're already in the war, they're already in the emergency war, they're just beginning to figure that out. Time is running out for them. Yeah, but again, I mean, uh, there's a yeah, persistent neoliberal here who would say that, okay, you actually need money to make money. I mean, if you actually... What does, what does that even mean? It's just a truism. Governments print money. I mean, think about the absurdity of taxation, right? I have to spend half my life earning a piece of paper to give the piece of paper back to the guy who printed the bit of paper. Now, you know, you say this and suddenly it's like, you want to run the printing presses overnight. No, I'm just pointing out the absurdity of vacuous neoliberal statements like, you need money to make money. Well, not true. Donald Trump took an $8 billion company and turned it into a $3 billion company. You can have money and lose money too. These, this is exactly the problem, getting beyond these completely empty statements. Yeah, but again, this would mean that uh, you actually, it's uh, just a problem of currency. There's nothing on how money circulates and what taxes should be imposed, in a sense. Yeah, like having one currency and having all these different economies and having no mechanisms to adjust, whether they're private sector mechanisms, like capital markets, which is what happens in the United States, or whether they're public ones, such as official transfers, is wrong. It, you know, it just, it's not going to sustain itself. So, you know, the Germans have this thing about we don't want this to become a transfer union. What do you think you're in? Right? At the end of the day, you're transferring labor, you're transferring skills, you're transferring responsibilities. It goes with the gig. And you get an undervalued exchange rate by having your super efficient economy buried in all these less efficient economies. You can sell more BMWs to the Chinese. The quid pro quo for that sometimes is when the Greeks get into trouble, you need to pony up the cash. Don't kid yourself otherwise. If uh, finance minister Yogi Tagalotos asks you after the debate, OK, Mark, you know, you're like, at certain points, you're right. Like, advise me, what would you suggest? First one is, the only way Greece is ever going to figure out what it wants to be is if it figures out what it wants to be. So, as far as I can figure out, and this is the narrative I hear from most Greeks as well, is that after the period of the colonels, you had two parties that essentially were families that took turns stealing the state. And once that was exhausted, thank God the EU came on top, because then you had new income streams with which you could fill the state so you could take turns stealing it. Then you got private capital flows in the 2000s, they got misappropriated and stolen and there's nothing left. So I've been asking people the whole time I've been here, what exactly is the business model of this place? Who exactly is in charge? So if I go to Italy, I can talk to the northern capitalist elite, I know who they are, right? If I go to France, it's really easy to find them, they all went to the same six schools, they run everything. If I go to the Mittelstand, I know who these guys are. If I go to the German financial sector, I know who they are, what their interests are, what they do, how they make money in the world. I don't know that you know that. And until you figure that out, you're basically going to be a ward of court. You need to have your own sustainable business model for existing in a world which is an entirely globalized world. And you haven't figured that out yet. Until you do, you're in trouble. Yeah, again, our left just wants to move the right down. Though. That's it. I mean, basically, it's like I want to occupy the best de deck chair on the Titanic before it sinks, right? You know, th this this seems to be what your politics is about. So, you know, part of this is you, you, the, the dilemma is this: in order, think about your tax collection, right? So, you've got the last budget 
uh, the, the last thing that went through Parliament a few days ago. So, you know, now taxes are going to be 70%, right? Okay, well, this makes you, and this enables you in an Excel sheet to promise to raise revenue so that you'll hit your 3.5% surplus target, right? And I'm Father Christmas. Because you're never going to do it. It becomes meaningless. It's just performance, right? But at the same time, your actual ability to collect taxes, which has never been that awesome, but it's never been as bad as people have said, has actually collapsed. You're basically collecting 40% of all reasonable taxes at this point. So here's the deal. In order to get beyond that and get out of that trap, you need a state that's efficient enough to really collect some taxes so you can provide public goods, so that people have faith in the system, so they're willing to invest, so you can move forward. But the problem is you hate your state and you don't trust your political class. So the last thing you're going to do is give them enough resources to make sure they can do that job. That's a tough one to go. out of. So if I can read between the lines, what you would suggest is like you, could, like, you should uh, ban tax evaders from the state, you should uh, put them in jail, you should... Uh, well, that's just one symptom. It's more, it's, no, it's, it's, it's more about, it's definitely more than that. It's about having a plan. I mean, think about the Israelis, which is often held up as an example to Greece, right? By 1978, they had no economy left. It was basically a war economy that had just been knackered three times. The kibbutz model was done the whole lot. So what did they do? They brought in Motorola. They spent a lot of money investment in engineering education, mathematical education, and they basically created tech clusters, and they became globally competitive and really interesting niches, etc. And you know, sure, you know, there's still an upper level, middle, upper middle level income country. They still got lots of inequality, etc. But like, they survived, and they have a business model, and they know who you are. They know who they are. Greece needs to get into that process. But it seems that because people are so interested in occupying the best deck chair on the Titanic, no one actually has a focus on like how you get off the Titanic. And you know, that's what it is. So you know, yeah, Euclid could please raise more taxes. Well, to do what with them? Right? You've got to have some kind of plan that people can actually buy into and believe in. And that's the bit that's lacking. Yeah, but Susan kind of had this plan. Yeah, no, they had this plan, but then, you know, they, you know, whether they mishandled it or not is an open question. But, you know, their capacity to implement it was extremely compromised, to say the least. Particularly when you start basically switching off everybody's access to the ATMs. I mean, that's kind of harsh. You know, how about we do this? Eh, 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 eh. Yeah, that'll work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The point is that, you know, we're, we're, we're under this uh, memorandum for three years, and we received three uh, security, we received three bailouts. And nothing seems to work. I mean, no reforms seem to work. Right. Well, like, what, what, what's the problem? Well, here's the problem. Like, here, what do you mean by reforms, right? So, you know, there's some abstract notion of, like, if you get rid of the pharmacy monopoly, right? So, great. Well, like, like let, let's fuck pharmacists, right? So, I can now buy my uh, opremazole for my acid reflux over the counter in a supermarket, which has got deregulated hours, so it's cheaper, so we can all buy drugs at 10 o'clock at night. Please tell me how that reinvigorates an economy that's lost 30% of GDP. This is a fantasy. 